On December 8, 1941, the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States declared war on Japan, but not Germany. It was only on December 11th, after Germany and Italy declared war on the United States, that the United States declared war on them. There was strong antipathy against Japan well before Pearl Harbor, but while waning, support for staying out of the war in Europe was still significant. Well, by 1941, 68% of Americans thought it might be necessary to fight Germany. That was a recent and substantial increase over prior years. When a majority thought we should, we should not fight in Europe's wars at all. Part of this reluctance was due to the influence of public on public opinion by six powerful newspaper owners who presented Germany favorably to the public in their papers. In her book, Newspaper Access, Six Press Barons Who Enabled Hitler, Professor Catherine Olmsted shows us how newspapers in the United States and Britain did their best to keep us out of any war in Europe. I've read her book, by the way, and I can recommend it heartily. Since 1993, Dr. Olmsted has been professor of history at UC Davis. She has her PhD from Davis and her BA from Stanford. Dr. Olmsted, the mic is yours. All right, so uh, so my name's Catherine Olmsted. Um, I'm a professor of history at UC Davis. Um, I study the political and cultural history of the United States from World War I up to the present. Um, and with a particular focus on the rise of the right and uh, conspiracy theories uh, spread by the right. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of busy these days. Um, but this uh, this talk that I'm giving you today is my most recent book that was published um, two years ago. So it's called uh, The Newspaper Axis, Six, Barons, Six Press Barons Who Enabled Hitler. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about how I came to this topic, why I was interested in it, then what I found, what I argue in the book, and then finally, why it's important, uh, not just for understanding World War II, but for understanding where we are today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, how did I get interested in this topic? About my previous book, Before the Newspaper Axis, was called Right Out of California, and it was about labor struggles in California in the 1930s. And when I was researching that book, I was really struck by... Uh, at that time, the book came out in 2015, the difficulty of reading the press reports on it, because at that point in California history, the 1930s, more than 60 percent of Californians got their news from a newspaper owned by William Randolph Hearst. Um, and he owned not only the biggest papers in San Francisco and Los Angeles, he was not only big in California, but of course, around the United States. And his newspapers were not digitized until very recently. And also they were dismissed by a lot of historians who would say like, oh, you know, Hearst, he was crazy. You know, he was this right-wing lunatic. Why would we pay attention to what he, he thought? So as a result, a lot of the histories of the era had not really drawn on how a lot of people understood the news of the time, because historians had not uh, taken the time to go to the microfilm to look at these Hearst newspapers. So as I did that for this book, uh, for Right Out of California, I started thinking about, you know, there are a whole lot of... Um, newspapers in the 1930s that were tabloids that sold a lot of copies that were dismissed by intellectuals, political leaders at the time. And it would be interesting to go look at those newspapers, the ones that people actually read, as opposed to the elite opinion leaders, uh, like the New York Times say, to look at these best-selling newspapers and see how they portrayed politics. And uh, as I said, I, I started out with Hearst. I was most interested in him uh, because he was the most influential uh, press figure of the time, arguably the most influential press figure in American history. He reached 30 million readers a week at a time when the population of the United States was about 120 or 130 million. 
So it was huge penetration. Um, he had newspapers. He had 28 newspapers around the country. He had uh, newspapers in all of the biggest cities. And he also owned mass circulation uh, magazines. And he owned a feature film company. And he owned a newsreel company. Uh, in addition to his this uh, shows, he had lots of real estate and uh, mines and ranches throughout the United States and Latin America. He was probably the richest person in the United States at that time. You know? So owning a newspaper back then was a way to uh, make a lot of money. Right. So unsurprisingly, Hearst was very much opposed to. Um, after the first couple of months, he came to be very opposed to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. He really hated taxes, especially progressive taxes that hit the, you know, the richest, the hardest. And he really hated unions, especially after they started unionizing his newsrooms, after his employees started organizing. So he uh, became just vitri vitriolically anti-New Deal. And he uh, not only wrote all these editorials about how Franklin Roosevelt was a communist, but he directed his reporters to cover the news uh, in a way that uh, made the New Deal seem like it was extremely far left. And uh, as I started reading all of these Hearst newspapers, I thought, well, I suppose that's not very surprising that here you have this very rich man who didn't like taxes and unions, right? But what was interesting is despite all of his influence, he wasn't able to stop Roosevelt from getting reelected three times. And he wasn't able to stop the New Deal. But the more I started reading these newspapers, I thought, you know, he was much more successful in another realm. He wasn't so successful in domestic politics, but he was very effective in foreign policy. And his foreign policy was he proudly called himself an isolationist. And by that, he meant that regardless of what happened in Europe, he did not think that the United States should get involved. And he became more and more convinced of this over time and was one of the biggest opponents of Franklin Roosevelt's Lend-Lease Bill to, to aid Britain in 1941. He called it the Dictator Bill. Mm -hmm. And his newspapers called it the Dictator Bill. So I thought, you know, it's really interesting to look at how he was able to influence Americans so that they were very reluctant to get involved in World War II. Now, I should say, he called himself an isolationist. That didn't mean that he thought the United States should not invade Latin America. No. Um, and he was also very big on being very confrontational with Japan. It was just he did not want the United States to go to war with Nazi Germany. And one of the reasons that he was a lot more effective in foreign policy than domestic politics was that he had help. He had like-minded friends in the press, other publishers who agreed that the United States should not take any stance against Nazi Germany. Right. And uh, as I continued the research, I realized that a lot of these press barons in the U.S. who did not think the U.S. should get involved against Germany were also communicating and coordinating with British press barons. And so I ended up focusing the book on six of them, the six who had the biggest circulations and who ranged from being overtly pro-Hitler, pro-fascist, to just being extremely anti-interventionist. And uh, I calculate that between them, these six publishers in the U.S. and the U.K. reach 60 million Americans and Britons every week. Okay, so what I want to do now is briefly tell you who these six were um, and then what it was like to read a newspaper that was published by them in the 1930s. Okay, so the most overtly pro-Hitler of these publishers was a man named uh, Harold Rothermere, Lord Rothermere. Uh, he owned 
the uh, Daily Mail in London. You might know the Daily Mail today. Its website is the is the most popular news website in the world. It was um, and is, a, you know, a, a tabloid, very sensationalistic um, and very nationalistic, very Britain first, as Rothermir often said. Um, and Rothermir owned the Daily Mail, which was at the beginning of the 30s, the best selling newspaper in the UK. So it was he had a lot of influence. He was extremely anti-communist, very afraid of the Soviets sweeping across Europe. And he saw Adolf Hitler as uh, as this, you know, barrier to the spread of communism. So he was very pro-Hitler. He wrote um, articles in favor of Hitler. As you can see, he socialized with Hitler. Okay, so that's uh, uh, at one end of the spectrum. Um, the other British publisher that I look at is a man named Max Beaverbrook, Lord Beaverbrook. As in Britain, they were literal press lords. In the U.S., they are often called press lords, but these were in Britain. They had actually been ennobled. Um, and uh, Max Beaverbrook, Lord Beaverbrook, owned the Daily Express, which by the late 1930s was the best-selling newspaper in England. Now, Beaverbrook was a little more complex than Rothermir. He was never overtly pro-fascist, but he strongly believed that the British should not take any steps that would antagonize Hitler, or should not object to his attempts to take over his neighbors. All right, then let's look at the Americans. All right, as I said, I started with William Randolph Hearst, um, and he was, um, at the beginning of the 1930s, very much a fan of Hitler. He thought he was making Germany great again um, and gave him a lot of coverage. All right, so I've already introduced you to Hearst. Um, now, Hearst had so many readers in part because he had figured out a formula um, that is uh, here on the slide. Um, he said this is what he wanted his editors to do. He wanted readers to look at the first page and say, oh, gosh, and at the second page and say, gee whiz, and at the third page and say, holy Moses. Right? So he uh, tried to give the, the readers what they wanted which was, of course, a lot of um, sex and murder and crime and sports and comics. But while he had them, then he would give them his foreign policy views as well. Right. All right. And then the other three that I look at were all cousins. Um, Joseph Medill Patterson, Robert McCormick, and Eleanor Medill Patterson, who went by the name Sissy Patterson. Now, these three cousins were grandchildren of a man named Joseph Medill, who had been an early supporter of Abraham Lincoln, um, a mayor of Chicago, and the owner of the Chicago Tribune. And as I say, back then, in the 19th century, this was a way to make money, was to own a newspaper. So when Joseph Medill died, he left this enormous fortune in his newspaper, uh, and uh, after a short transition period, two of his grandsons pictured here, Joe Patterson and Robert McCormick, took over the Chicago Tribune. Chicago Tribune was not a tabloid. You know, it's a regular sized newspaper. You know what a tabloid is, right? It's like you read it on the subway. You can read it like a book, right? The Chicago Tribune was not a tabloid. And it was not necessarily sensationalistic, but it was very popular. And it was the most popular, the best-selling, regular size newspaper in the country. Now, Joe Patterson and Robert McCormick ran the Chicago Tribune together for a while until they had a falling out. And Joe Patterson moved to uh, New York and started his own newspaper there. Uh, Robert McCormick turned the Chicago Tribune into a leading voice of conservatism in the United States. Um, he was one of the most conservative leaders in the country. Um, critics said he had the greatest mind of the 14th century. He, he was conservative on absolutely every issue. And he was also proudly isolationist by what she meant. We should not get involved in Europe. Okay. 
Now, Robert McCormick not only owned uh, the Chicago Tribune, which had about a, which sold a million copies a day, uh, more on Sundays. And back then they figured about four readers per copy. Um, so he not only had that influence through his newspaper, he also owned WGN radio. WGN uh, was stood for the main letters of the uh, slogan of the Chicago Tribune, which was world's greatest newspaper. And uh, WGN was one of the most powerful uh, radio stations in the country. It had a 50,000 watt signal. Uh, so you could hear it over much of the country. And on WGN, McCormick used that, as he did his newspaper, to propagate his conservative views. And he had his own show um, once a week where he would, uh, you know, talk to his viewers, his, I'm sorry, his listeners, his readers about politics. So Joe Patterson, his cousin, moved to New York and decided to start the New York Daily News, which was America's first tabloid newspaper in 1919. And it soon became the most popular newspaper in American history, then or since. By World War II, it was selling almost 4 million copies a day on Sundays and more than 2 million daily. And as I say, they thought that four people would read each copy. Mm -hmm. um, the Daily News, like Hearst newspapers, gave people what they wanted. Um, this is what one of... Um, Patterson's editor said the things people were most interested in were, and in order, lover, sex, money, and murder. They were especially interested in any situation which involved all three. And so the Daily News tried to find stories like this as much as possible. Um, one of the most famous Daily News covers of all time is this one from 1928. So let me tell you the story here. This is a woman named Ruth Snyder. She conspired with her lover to kill her husband. So there was love, there was an insurance policy, so there was money, there was crime. Uh, the Daily News desperately wanted to film her getting killed in the electric chair. Uh, but the state of New York said no, no pictures. So a Daily News still photographer sneaked, well, came into the uh, chamber, to the viewing chamber, with the reporters and he had a camera strapped to his ankle and then he had two cords going up his pants leg and one of them he used to pull up his pants at the crucial moment and the other one to snap the shutter. And so he got a picture of her, you know, being electrocuted by the state. They had anticipated they would sell a lot, so they printed 300,000 extra copies that day. They sold out immediately and had to print more, right? So the Daily News seemed to have the, the right idea about how to sell newspapers. The Daily News was also, and remained for many decades, famous for its sports and its comics, right? So all of these things together made people buy the Daily News. But again, um, once they were there, Joe Patterson would then treat them to his own political views. All right, and finally, the one woman in this group, this is his sister, Sissy Patterson. I just love this picture of her. Um, she was a, you know, a socialite. Um, in those days, she wasn't expected to be a newspaper uh, man like her like her brother and cousin. Um, she went to Europe. She married a count. She had a quite dramatic life when the count beat her and then stole her baby. And she had to get the president to intervene to get her baby back. She was in the newspapers, but she was not a newspaper reporter uh, until 1930. Right about the time she turned 50, um, and she went to her brother and cousin and said, I really want to run a newspaper. And they were like, we'll find one. You know, we're not giving you hours. So she went to her friend Hearst, and he said, well, I'm not going to sell you a newspaper, but you can be my publisher of one of my Washington newspapers, Washington, D.C. So that's how she started out. Um, soon she was the editor and publisher of two of Hearst newspapers in Washington, D.C., and then in 1937, he finally sold out to her so that she bought 
uh, the Washington Times, the Washington Herald merged them, and the Washington Times Herald became uh, the best-selling newspaper in Washington, D.C. And she was the first female publisher of a major metropolitan newspaper in the 20th century. So uh, she, by owning this Washington, D.C. newspaper, helped give her brother uh, a national uh, platform. Because as you can imagine, back then, before the internet, uh, if you're in Washington, D.C., you're not going to see the New York Daily News, except maybe a day late. Right? But what she would do would be to print her brother's news stories and his editorials in her Washington newspaper and thus give him a Washington voice. Okay. All right. Um, just briefly here, I have this graph um, to show you. This is um, shows you uh, the circulation, so not the total readership, but the number of uh, copies, not the number of copy, the number of copies sold. And this is Hearst daily and Sunday circulation. This is the McCormick Patterson newspapers, uh, and this is the New York Times, and this is the New York Herald Tribune. So uh, I believe that in decades past, when a lot of historians wrote about the foreign policy of the 1930s, they missed a big piece of the story by ignoring these newspapers, which they considered to be, you know, not intellectual, right-wing, tabloid, sensationalistic. But nevertheless, these were the newspapers that the people who worked in the airplane factories, the people who would serve in World War II. This is, these were the newspapers that a lot of these people were reading. All right, so what would you read? Let me see. Uh, if you were reading these newspapers, what would you see? Well, let me start chronologically here with 1930. Um, Hearst paid a lot of um, world leaders to write, write for his newspapers, a lot of money, like sometimes ten to $20,000 in 1930s dollars. Um, and among the leaders that he paid to write were Adolf Hitler and some of Hitler's uh, top Nazis. Uh, so here is one of Hitler's stories that appeared in a Hearst newspaper. Uh, in September of, of 1930. So you can see that this is normalization here, right? You can read Churchill, you can read David Lloyd George, or you can read Adolf Hitler. They're all appearing in the Hearst newspapers. Uh, Hearst continued to be quite bullish on Hitler, just thought he was great up until late of 1934. In 1934, uh, he went to Europe on a tour. He met Hitler. He then wrote about the experience, said that he was extraordinary. He was a great leader. You know, the classic thing, he made the trains um, run on time. You know, this was already at that point, there had been uh, a lot of anti-Semitic laws passed in Germany. The first concentration camp at Dachau was already set up. Uh, but Hearst, like Rothermere, believed that, that Hitler um, could stop the communists and therefore was someone to be uh, admired. Mm -hmm. Then there was Lord Rothermere in the Daily Mail. Um, Rothermere was, of all of these six, that I looked at, by far the most positive. Um, he wrote several stories personally about the Nazi party, about Hitler, about how they were transforming Germany, how they were helping it recover from all of the humiliations after World War I. Um, Rothermere, unlike Hearst, never backed away from that pro-Hitler coverage. Up until 1939, he was very much a Hitler uh, supporter uh, until the war started in Europe, and he, it was obviously no longer viable for him to do that. Um, he also was, uh, Rothermere was also supportive of fascists in, Germ uh, in uh, Britain. The British fascists were called the Black Shirts, um, and for a period of about a year, Rothermere really supported them, gave them lots of propaganda, and encouraged people to join the British uh, Union of Fascists. 
All right. Well, what about in the United States besides Hearst? What about the um, Patterson McCormick's? Well, this is a sort, I'm giving you this uh, image here. This is a sort of editorial that you would see in the New York Daily News that was then again um, run in the Washington Times Herald. I think I pulled out the quote. Um, this was uh, an editorial when Germany reoccupied the, the Rhineland. And the New York Daily News says, you know, it's after all, it's his territory. You know, why is everybody so upset? Um, there was a similar editorial in Max Beaver Books, London Daily Express. Um, he didn't say, well, the Germans have the right to it, but he said, who cares? What does that mean to us? Let's not do anything to provoke him because if we condemn this too stridently, he could turn his ire towards uh, the British and the British Empire. And we don't want that. We don't want any of this trouble. So we should not do anything to have boycotts or condemnations. What happens in Europe is their problem. Uh, this was the tone of the Daily Express coverage up until the beginning of the war on September 1st, 1939. So here, for example, is a, a Daily Express headline from 1938, September 1938. Uh, this was something that, that Beaverbrook, it was a line that he pushed a lot, that Hitler was fundamentally reasonable. You know, he was an ordinary world leader. You could talk to him. Uh, he would never do anything rash or self-destructive. And so uh, Britain should... Uh, work with him as opposed to uh, draw lines and oppose him. Um, Beaver Brook was of similar mind with Joe Patterson at the New York Daily News. So this is one of the things that I found in Beaver Brook's papers that I thought was very interesting. Um, this is a brochure that Beaver Brook put together you can see this is the British Lion and the Statue of Liberty. So the idea is you have Anglo-American cooperation. And it says here, from across the Atlantic. And once you opened up this flyer, it had an editorial from the New York Daily News about how the United States should not do anything to provoke Hitler, should be as isolationist or anti-interventionist as possible. And so Beaverbrook said, that's great, that American really understands things. So he put together this brochure to popularize this idea in Britain. He printed 10 million copies of it, and then he hired people to go give it to every household in Great Britain. So in the with the implication, even the Americans don't want to get involved, we should not get involved. Um, and Beaverbrook maintained this belief that isolation, appeasement was the best thing to do up until August of 1939. So just a few weeks before the, the war began, um, they ran the Daily Express, Beaverbrook's paper, ran this infamous headline, or it became infamous, um, predicting that everything was fine, no one in Britain should worry, there was not gonna be any war, right? and. Three weeks later, the, the Germans were in Poland. So once the Germans were in Poland, once the war began in Europe, obviously Beaverbrook and Rothermere um, had to get on board, right? They could no longer talk about how great Hitler was. Their country was at war with Hitler. Um, they weren't thrilled with the war, but they didn't say, you know, Hitler is actually very peaceful. So their coverage then uh, stops being pro-appeasement. In the U.S., the next question is, how did the U.S. press barons respond to this, respond to the war starting in Europe? And what they said was, okay, so now Britain's involved, so what? Now the whole European continent is consumed with war, so what? What does that have to do with us? And they started coming up with lots of conspiracy theories about why anyone would want to get the U.S. involved in the European war. So uh, one of the arguments that they made, like, this is why we should not do anything to provoke Hitler or support the British. One thing they said was that really 
The only reason that Franklin Roosevelt believed that the U.S. should take a strong stand in support of Britain was that he wanted war because a war would make it easy for him to become a dictator. And, you know, they had hated Roosevelt before this, so it just sort of all flowed naturally from their political points of view. Um, so you can see this, as I mentioned earlier, in the coverage of the Lend-Lease debate. Lend-Lease was this bill uh, that Roosevelt proposed that allowed the U.S. to lend, lease, or otherwise dispose of um, war material, weapons, to Great Britain. And later, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, to the Soviet Union, right? But at the time it was being debated, it was about Britain. And... Uh, Hearst newspapers called this not Lend-Lease, not uh, the, the number of the bill, which is 1776, which was very clever uh, on the part of the Roosevelt administration, but they called it the Dictator Bill. Um, and as you can see, this isn't an editorial, this is a headline. So readers are being told, oh, Congress is debating whether to allow uh, Roosevelt to be a dictator. Um, the Hearst newspapers actually seemed moderate compared to uh, the Chicago Tribune, uh, which consistently, every time they mentioned Lynn Lease, would call it the dictatorship bill and talk about how it was going to enable Roosevelt to be a dictator. Right. Okay, so that's one argument. That's why we should not get involved, these newspapers said. It's really just a scheme by Roosevelt to get more power. Another argument that they made was that the British were taking advantage of Americans. Once again, the British got into a war and expected the Americans to come and save them. Uh, and that, you know, they were just very clever that way. And they played Americans for fools or using the language of the time uh, for saps. The U.S. was a sap. And you can see this in uh, the cartoons, the political cartoons of the Daily News. This cartoonist actually won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for these. Um, and he portrayed, you know, the traditional Uncle Sam uh, character, uh, but it was Uncle Sap. Right? And then there's this woman who is, as you can see, uh, very has a skull for a face. She is deaf. She is evil. And she was seducing Uncle Sap into fighting wars for Britain. Uh, here's another one where he's saying, uh, here's looking at you and she says, cheerio, you bloody blighter. Um, so she's obviously British and they're toasting each other with um, uh, glasses labeled the dictatorship bill. Another argument you see again and again in these newspapers about why the U.S. should not involve itself uh, in a war to, to support Great Britain against the Nazis is that it was a race war. And this was particularly uh, evident in the New York Daily News. Um, here's an editorial from 1941 called The Passing of the Great Race, question mark. The Passing of the Great Race was the name of a, of a best-selling book uh, that was that reached a lot had a lot of popularity in the 1920s that argued that the U.S. should stop allowing Southern Europeans into the United States because they were diluting the gene pool, you know, bringing down the intelligence because you should just allow Northern Europeans to come to the United States, right? And so Patterson's argument was that um, if Anglo Americans fought Germany, it would be all white people fighting each other, a lot of them would die, and then what he called the yellow race would take over the world. So this is, you know, an editorial in the best-selling newspaper in the country. All right, and finally, you might expect, um, there was the argument that really the only reason that Americans were considering helping Great Britain against Hitler was that it was the Jews. Um, the Jews were conspiring to uh, drag the country into a war. Um, sometimes this is not as overt as you might expect. Um, for example, here's an editorial from the Daily News. It's about anti-Semitism, uh, where they say, some people, plenty of people, are exercising their right to dislike the Jews. Mm -hmm. 
Um, now we think that whatever racial faults were in old world Jews are no longer in the new world Jews. So we're not anti-Semitic. We believe in the melting pot. We think they come over here and they're fine. But the editorial goes on, you know, if they keep trying to drag us into a war, then they should watch out because plenty of people hate them and it can get very, very violent. And you see this argument over and over again in the New York Daily News. We're not anti-Semitic. We're just worried that if the Jews drag us into a war, um, that, you know, other people could take it out on them. Uh, here's another one that I that I like um, because it's about the the FBI discovered that there were a bunch of American Nazis who were going to blow things up. They were domestic terrorists, and the New York Daily News said, "Really? You know, these dreamy-eyed young men—they're plotting to overthrow the government. Come on, they're nice young white American boys. They're not the people we should be afraid of." Right. The Jews, however, are creating too much sympathy for their racial kinfolk in Europe. And as a result, a lot of people are a lot of Americans are mad at the Jews. All right. Obviously, this did not work. <laughs> the United States got into World War II, fought World War II from December of 1941 up until uh, 1945. Um, and I do have to say for William Randolph Hearst, once the war began, he did have a lot of criticism of the way Franklin Roosevelt uh, ran the war. He believed it should be a specific first strategy, destroy Japan and then go against Germany. But Hearst in general, uh, you know, waved the flag and said, this is a war that we need to win. We need to support the troops, if not the government. Right. It's really a different story at the New York Daily News. The New York Daily News was much more convinced that it was the wrong war, that the United States was fighting the wrong war at the wrong time with the wrong enemy. Um, so, oh, I don't know how that happened. Um, should I do? So the the last couple of slides that I have there are of um, editorials from the Daily News during the war that continue to use the phrase America first. Um, a lot of times people thought that uh, um, historians say, oh, opposition to the war ended after Pearl Harbor. But in fact, um, you know, that's not what I found in the Daily News, which again was the best selling newspaper in the United States. So there were a lot of people who were saying, we need to be for America first. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Play, play in window. Play. There we go. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, so they continue to use this phrase America first. The America first committee disbanded. Um, but they, but the daily news said, this is really what we, what we need. And, um, finally, the Daily News continually suggested that um, Franklin Roosevelt was so dedicated to this war, which, as I said, they believe was a wrong war, um, that he was going to um, try and win re-election in 1944 and then never have another election. And it's interesting because I'm sure you're aware that people on all sides now, um, you hear people saying, well, I'm not sure that this could be the last election. You hear that in 1944 from Roosevelt's opponents who say if he gets in power, then he's never gonna let it go. And he's going to appoint one of his sons to be his successor. Um, right. Finally, when the war ended, one last conspiracy theory that these press barons uh, promulgated was a Pearl Harbor conspiracy theory. I don't know if many of you are aware of this conspiracy theory that says Roosevelt knew that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked, uh, but allowed it to be attacked or maybe provoked the Japanese into attacking because he wanted to go to war against Germany. And so he had all of these 
puzzle pieces all over the world, and he deliberately exposed Americans to this to this menace. Um, so that he could get into the war. Well, this conspiracy theory is first printed in the Chicago Tribune on the day that the that the war ends. Uh, they were holding the story. They waited for the war to end so they couldn't be called unpatriotic. And they publish it on that day and say, there's a lot of evidence. People are saying um, that who knows? President Roosevelt, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I hear it on the radio. Um, so this continues on into the present, right? All right, finally, what is the what is the takeaway here? What is the significance? Well, the Daily Mail and the Daily Express still exist. They're still very popular. They're still very nationalistic. They were both very much in favor of Brexit. In fact, the Daily, Daily Express took credit for Brexit, claimed that it was the one who started the campaign. And so uh, on the day here, that it finally took place. They were like, yes, the Daily Express has finally separated Britain from uh, from Europe. So you can definitely, in those two newspapers, see um, the the roots that stretch back to World War II, see those, those sentiments, those political views, that nationalism, that aggressive nationalism, that anti-European nationalism is still there. In the U.S., obviously, the newspapers aren't nearly as powerful as they were, and those newspapers either don't exist or they're shadows of their former selves. But um, I think there are heirs to that tradition in the press, and you can certainly see Fox News, for example, is that kind of unapologetic, nationalistic, uh, right-wing media um, that is continuing into the present. So even though these the last of these press barons died in the 1960s, so over half a century ago, um, you can hear the echoes of their voices in these continuing calls for Britain first and America first. All right, thank you. And we still have 15 minutes for questions. Yes. We're gonna do it. We have a microphone so they can come. Yeah. yeah. Can you do this? I my got a bad foot. So. <laughs> I think there's a question over here. Yes. Okay. It isn't as much of a question as, as a, something to think about. Um, I had not realized a lot of this happened until I read Rachel Nowdow's book. Mm -hmm. And what made me think is what if Japan had not bombed the bomb Pearl Harbor. What would have happened? Well, I think that as far as the U.S. getting into war with Germany, that would have eventually happened. The U.S. was in an undeclared naval war with the Germans at that time. No, uh, the the Germans sunk an American ship, the Reuben James, in, in October of 1941. I think they would have continued to con to do that sort of thing, and eventually Roosevelt would have asked Congress to declare war. It would have been very, very contentious. I mean, he didn't ask at the time that the Reuben James was sunk uh, because he knew he wouldn't get a, a declaration of war. Right. So he would have there would have been this continuing tension, escalation, aggression in the Atlantic with the Nazis. And eventually, I think it would have escalated to the point where he said, we have to have a declaration of war. But it wouldn't have been, you know, just one person in Congress opposing it as what is what happened after Pearl Harbor. It would have been far more divisive. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for just a stunningly good presentation. Uh, quick question about another highly influential press family. And what were they up to at this time? The Chandlers in Los in the Los Angeles area. Where were where were they at at this point on these issues? Well, the Chandlers uh, were very very anti communist. They were very much opposed to Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, they would say in the editorials they would call him Stalin Delano Roosevelt. Um, so they were very anti New Deal. Um, they were not particularly isolationist though. And so once the war began, uh, they were very much, you know, pro-support the truth. Yeah. 
were they were they opposed to uh, intervention? Yes, although it really wasn't that much of an issue. I think that all of these people that I focused on, um, the four Americans, saw themselves as national opinion leaders. You no, know, and their their uh, newspapers were in New York and Washington D.C. and Chicago, and they believed that we need to weigh in on these important things. Whereas uh, the Los Angeles Times at that moment, because just of, because of technology, was not that influential outside of Southern California. Question here: mm -hmm. Do you have any idea if any of these barons spoke with each other about this? Um, this interest in preventing, or I should say, encouraging Hitler? Um, well, certainly Beaverbrook and Patterson. So Beaverbrook's the one who put together the, the flyer that had Patterson's um, editorial. They corresponded uh, and they they traveled together. They actually, you know, back then you were a rich person, you would charter a plane and then you just go all around Europe. They traveled together with their families they tried to interview Mussolini. They tried to interview Hitler, um, who weren't interested in talking to them. They would talk to Hearst, but not to Patterson and Breva Brook. Um, but uh, so they, th so those two were quite tight, and so that's how they came up with this idea that you know we should really work together to tell people in Britain that there are American isolationists and tell American isolationists that there are British appeasers. Um, Rothermere and Beaverbrook also, the, the two British guys, uh, talked a lot. Um, Beaverbrook told Rothermere he did not go in for the whole, you know, Nazi fan club thing. Um, but they, you know, they definitely agreed that the that uh, the Chamberlain government should do everything it could to appease Hitler. Um, and of course... The Medill Pattersons, um, McCormick's, that that family, they talked. Um, the six of them never sat down um, and had a confab. Um, Hearst really famously didn't collaborate with anyone, um, but but there was some collaboration, and so that's where I got the title from, the newspaper Axis, which implies cooperation. Right? It was the term that Roosevelt's attack dog. It was the Secretary of Interior, Harold Ickes. Harold Ickes was known for going on the radio and making these like fire-breathing speeches um, attacking Roosevelt's uh, opponents. And he's the one who called them the newspaper axis. And then there was the whole episode with Patty Hearst. Uh, but anyway, I'm a little surprised that you, uh, maybe I'm out of line by bring this up uh henry ford and his uh dearborn independent didn't they didn't he wasn't he a sympathizer at least until uh the beginning of the war yeah there's definitely other people that i could have uh brought up i made sort of an editorial decision at one point to make it i hope more readable by focusing on six main characters rather than everyone um because i thought otherwise you could sort of get get drowned in this but someone mentioned rachel maddow's book she talks a lot about the other uh nazi sympathizers in the united states there were a lot of them these people were just extremely influential because they owned um very uh popular newspapers i was going to ask about the uh, role of radio edward r Murrow had mm -hmm. uh reporters in berlin long after we were they were in poland Right. And uh, it, it would seem that there, some of this should have shown up among the radio powers as well. Right. That's a very good question. Um, so at the beginning of the period that I'm looking at here, 1930, 1933, most Americans, vast majority, get all of their news from the newspapers. That begins to shift in the course of the 1930s. Still as late as 1937, the polls show that a majority of people get their news from the newspapers. But by 1939, 1940, that's shifting. And I think that is very important for understanding, um, you know, how Roosevelt was able to sort of start turning public opinion. Because radio was a much more interventionist medium, not because they ran interventionist editorials, but because they had Murrow there, especially after the British uh, are involved. You know, in London, these live reports, we can hear the bombs falling. That's tremendously uh, influential. Um, in impacting Americans' views. 
So given our current media climate, what what can we learn from this? What can we kind of take away from this? I know it's kind of a big question, but there's just so many parallels, right? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a much different climate in part because of social media. So there's no longer these gatekeepers um, that where you could in the past, you could say, well, you know, there's, there's 12 people that reach uh, 80% of the Americans. Um, and then radio starts to disrupt that, but still it's only, you know, two, three networks at that point. Um, now, you know, anybody can share a, a meme um, and it can go viral. So it's much harder to know how do you fight that? I think you do try to fight it though, because that's what Roosevelt did. I mean, he he did it himself a little bit, but he didn't want to seem mean or political when he's being a war leader. So he had Harold Dickies do it, but it was very effective for Harold Dickies to go out and say, you know, these people, they're not your friends. They are actually sympathizing with the nation's enemies. And you should be very suspicious when you're, you should be skeptical of what they say about the war. Thanks. Uh, I believe at the beginning of your talk, you said that uh, the conservative publishers uh, had very little, made very little headway in opposing Roosevelt over the New Deal and were able to gain a lot more traction over international affairs. So why was that? I think that Roosevelt's domestic policies were just very uh, popular with a lot of people. And they might have continued to buy Hearst newspapers uh, for the sports uh, and for the murders. Uh, but, you know, Roosevelt was helping them join a union. And so, you know, they felt material changes in their lives. Um, and uh, with international affairs, it was just much more distant, right? And they didn't care nearly as much. So it was easier to believe, uh, you know, Roosevelt... Um, why is he so pro-British? Is that really something that Americans should support? Um, it's 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 much easier for the opponents to manipulate public opinion that way because there's less attention paid to it. When you were, t this was a wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When I was a very young reporter for the Sacramento Bee in 1969, there were very few women, very few, mm -hmm. if any, minorities. And I remember going through the microfilm to do the 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 the younger reporters were assigned to do that. And I was appalled at what I saw, you know, the, the yellow peril and huge headlines, Japs, you know, and other unprintable uh, terminologies. <laughs> Could you comment on, and the B was known as a liberal paper, you know, although they opposed the death penalty, they had a very poor record on mm -hmm. On women's issues and and issues of race and minorities, they had a whole page that was colored notes for many, many years. How do you look at current media and media and, and you know the changes in the 60s and the 70s in relation to what you have presented in your book, which is wonderful? And also, what was the bee's position in all of this? <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> is, that, is that my answer? Um, well, as far as uh, uh, the B, yeah, the B was liberal. The B was uh, progressive uh, in the, in the sense that it really wanted uh, native-born white working people to get together and fight for their rights, to unionize, to have strong regulations, to have a government that. Uh, reflected their beliefs, you know, we were very pro-democracy. Um, but like Hiram Johnson, who was uh, governor and senator, he could be very much pro-democracy uh, in part by saying, well, these people don't count. These people can't vote. These people can't be citizens. So um, the B was very anti-Asian in, in, in those years, particularly anti-Japanese, but really anti-Asian in general. So uh, they weren't that different from Hearst in that they thought, you know, okay, if we're in this war, we really we need to take care of Japan. Um, much less interested in fighting the war against Germany, although, you know, supportive once it started. But for a lot of people who felt that way, who had even like domestic 
liberal political views, but we're very suspicious of uh, people of color around the world. Um, it was a little harder to see exactly what was wrong with what was going on in Germany. So. Would you care to compare the uh, Hearst model to the Murdoch model? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I, you know, until I immersed myself in the Hearst newspapers, I didn't realize what the Hearst, you know, how um, sensationalistic the Hearst model was. Um, I would say, I don't know. I think it's similar. I think it's quite similar. You know, how do you keep people, how do you keep eyeballs on the screen? How do you get people to keep turning the pages of the newspaper and going, oh my God, look, it's, well, it's on page three. Um, you have these sensational stories. And if you can really, if you're really good at it, you have these sensational stories that support your political beliefs. Hmm. Catherine, thank you so much.